learn today what what uh, subjects we're going to touch. Recently, uh, I've been working with private companies uh, to help them transition to uh, green or eco-friendly uh, practices within their offices. I've also worked with events companies and conducted events uh, with the vision of minimizing waste as much as possible. Um, and also this year, um, I have had uh, coaching and training on behavior centered approach, and we implemented one project um, uh, which takes into account the behavior inside of consumers um, and uh, which uh, basically designs interventions taking into account what behavior tendencies there are um, and what would be the most optimal and lasting change, uh, take, uh, considering what we know about people's psychology and their preferences, their barriers and their motivations. So this is something I would also like to discuss with you today. Um, and then uh, we will do some exercises to see uh, how, how you would approach similar situations and what solutions you would design taking into consideration for example, uh, what works on people's habits, on for changing people's habits, and what doesn't work, in your opinion. Um, before um, I go on to um, my presentation, I have a question for the audience, which you can reach uh, via menti.com um, using the code on the left-hand side. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, and post the question on the chat. Please uh, use the link and enter the code and answer the question. I will give one or two minutes for everyone to answer. I think uh, I would ask also, um, yes, we have three responses. I think only one person is missing because it, it, we have in fact four attendees. I think with, uh, Maria, I'm connected from three devices and that's why we saw her. Right, <laughs> okay. Uh, so we have we have more, um, more responses, okay. So the question is, which one of these would you be willing to give up forever? At the moment, um, straws and plastic bags are in the lead. Um, and I would like you to think, um, I think um, generally speaking, we think, oh, it's easy to give up either straws or plastic bags. Um, but I think it is easy for some people, but not so easy for others. Um, and even though it's absolutely essential that we do think about alternatives to these items because they are so destructive and uh, so abundant that uh, they're overflowing our land um, and being made out of plastic most of the time, they do stay and pollute our environment for many, many centuries. Um, but do we really understand everyone's experience do we really understand uh, how why or how people may not be able to give up these items so my question to you uh for the straw people would be um can you think of who might not be able to give up this item and why and i'm talking about specifically plastic straws So this is specific, this is uh, particularly for people who answered, uh, they will be able to give up straws. I wonder if you're if you think why 
someone might not be able to do so. Uh, okay, I'm just gonna look in the chat. Um, oh, someone said all four, um, disabled people and children, uh, people with diseases, exactly. Um, I was going through um, some campaigning materials recently um, and I came across this um, disabled uh, person's um, uh, YouTube channel uh, or some social media channel um, and she was very good at explaining that like environment and environmentalists really need to be nuanced in how we're campaigning about certain things and uh, she was very clearly dem demonstrating why plastic straws were absolutely necessary especially for hot food that she was unable to digest otherwise or eat um, and they were essential uh, part of her life. Um, so when we're campaigning uh, and when we are lobbying and advocating for certain changes, it's important to understand, uh, challenge our assumptions and understand different segments and make sure that we are we know who we are targeting, why, and that we're not doing um, any harm and we're not uh, kind of uh further strengthening some of these imbalanced power dynamics where some people's voices are completely drowned out and others are not can you think of um do you think that it's feasible to start pouring liquids into plastic uh something else other than plastic bottle And what could that be? And what might be um, kind of barriers or challenges with that? Why are so many companies perhaps against uh, trying to produce something other than plastic bottles? You can use the chat if you like. I think we don't really have uh, a response to this. But what I would say is that like a cost benefit to pro pro probably transporting uh, some of the bottles might be um, not so feasible for, for example, maybe smaller companies. Um, and with regards to, for example, plastic bags, um, is there any use of the plastic bag that you find it impossible to uh, imagine the replacement? Uh, do you think is is there anything that you use in plastic bag for that you couldn't use anything else for or you definitely think that um plastic bags can be replaced in every context uh, may i ask this question yes so I assume that like plastic bags actually in Azerbaijan, plastic bags started to replace the uh, paper bags, and uh, we had a traditional, um, a traditional basket uh, made by reed and cane. This is a plant growing uh, in a swampy areas. Mm -hmm. So we used to you we used to carry it for shopping, for mm -hmm. stores and all this stuff. So. After uh, collapsing USSR, after the market introduced the plastic bags and all this stuff, people realized that this is more convenient. Actually, like plastic bags is convenient. And um, and yes, and uh, therefore, like people just uh, started to forget, like switching, shifting into plastic bags. But of course, it's, uh, it's possible to go back uh, and uh, to raise awareness campaign regarding the negative uh, outcomes uh, mm -hmm. of plastics in our life, in our daily life and nature and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah, actually there's a big hope actually if we start uh, marketing on this issue. Mm -hmm. So you think uh, if we let people know uh, and market um, uh alternatives then it's enough and also perhaps if they're just as available as plastic bags then maybe the choice will be skewed towards uh, reusable alternatives right but because some might say that because they are everywhere now 
uh, uh, maybe it's not it basically influences an easier choice behavior for for customers and this is something that like um i will delve into later in the presentation uh we will talk about like what influences choice in our psychology uh and in what situations um do we uh choose not to think about it too much and uh what should we take into consideration in order to um really create or prompt or kickstart a change in behavior and that's something that we will talk about later on in more depth um i'm going to stop sharing uh mentimeter right now and go back to my presentation uh here we go. Mm -hmm. uh, so some of the um, most pressing issues, environmental issues that the world is talking about and we're all talking about, uh, I've just brought some out here, which is uh, waste management, uh, spe especially uh, plastic waste, energy and dependence on fossil fuels, climate change is a big one, which I'm sure uh, it was part of these webinar cycles and you talked a lot about it and loss of biodiversity. Uh, today, I would like to focus in the context of uh, basically uh, greening your offices and having behavior-centered approaches or interventions. I'm going to mainly focus on waste and plastic waste. Uh, and the reason I'm choosing plastic waste is because that's something that uh, is much, uh, let's say, more easily contributed towards by ordinary people and uh, that something is very um very much applies to every 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 uh environment problem applies to each one of us but this is much more obvious i think um and this is something that we've been working on um uh recently quite a lot uh and the reason plastic is a main focus uh is because uh there's compared to other waste streams for example um, plastic can uh, have uh, huge consequences on our environment and our health. Uh, we all know that uh, many tons of plastic is produced worldwide every year, uh, namely this is 380 million tons every year, and 50% of this is uh, of single use. Um, and now we know that uh, according to the recent research, microplastics are found in water, food, in our blood, and most recently discovered in mother's milk as well. Um, and these are some of the recent, um, sorry. Uh, these are some of the recent uh, articles that have been uh, circulating in the Guardian, that microplastics have been found in human breast milk for the first time, uh, and researchers are concerned over potential health impacts of chemical contaminate, contaminants in the babies. Uh, and it has also been found in human blood for the first time. Uh, and there's these particles can travel around the body and may lodge in some organs, so may uh, actually cause some clog uh, in in our bloodstreams, which is uh, a huge concern, of course, um, and not to um, not to bog you down with uh, just problems. There are many many alternatives and innovations that are uh, popping up now, and businesses are trying to kind of divert their um, their products in uh, response to this demand to come up with alternatives. And there's definitely a market for it and there's definitely a demand for it um, and there's definitely a need for this change and there's some innovations uh, that are uh, that we see we we are seeing appear on the market for example mushroom made food packaging uh, reusable bags um, and especially uh, a big concern is over packaging and this is not an easy topic because uh, plastic packaging sometimes can can uh, preserve food really well. So some supermarkets for this choice, they want to use certain materials, but it is discovered that it is absolutely excessive. 
and uh, buying in bulk and weights is actually a better environmental and con consumer choice. Um, so these are some of the directions. I'm only touching on this very briefly because I don't want to, it's a big topic of uh, what we can do uh, with regards to uh, solutions within the circular economy, but this is uh, maybe a topic for another day. Um, today, um, I want to focus on individual choices and what we can do as uh, as consumers uh, and how we can strive to make our workplaces uh, more eco-friendly. I'm going to share uh, another slide of the Mentimeter. Uh, if you use the same one second. If you use the same code, now uh, you should see uh, another question which says, in your opinion, what constitutes a green office? Uh, so please enter your ideas and your opinions, what you think uh, a green office should have in order to be eco-friendly. Um, and type in how, uh, up to three answers. Um, are people responding or am I not seeing the responses? I think some are reacting in the chat instead of Mentimeter. Ah, okay. Let's see. Let's see the chats. Uh -huh. Okay, so it's starting to show up. Uh, one of the answers is in a chat is decreasing paper consumption. Of course, yes, we're printing less recycling uh, paper waste. Uh, of course, uh, recycles recycling waste to maximum uh, equipment with low carbon emissions. Yes, resource efficiency, uh, green procurement, exactly. Uh, no plastic, uh, that's a good one. Energy efficiency, energy efficient buildings, of course. Um, uh, motion activation lights, yes. Uh, renewable energy and uh, smart energy consumption. Absolutely, I think uh, you are uh, definitely aware of uh, things that can be set um, into place in order to make workspaces uh, more eco-friendly. And the reason we started, for example, our organization started targeting um, individual companies and private sector to establish these norms is because um, on an infrastructural level in Georgia, especially, we don't have, for example, a, a, a a proper waste management infrastructure. Uh, we don't have uh, many regulations that control buildings uh, with resource efficiency. Uh, we don't have these standards yet in many Eastern European countries. Um, so until these standards and regulations come into force and our legislation adapts to modern standards, I think it's important that like, uh, for example, private companies can also do their share to start this trend and also um, assume a certain amount of responsibility uh, in caring for the environment and caring for their staff and for the well-being of, of, of their communities. So I think uh, whilst we're working very heavily with the government and on various regulations, we're also working with the private sector to um, set some boundaries and to establish some practices uh, which uh, rest of the world is also striving to change. I'm going to go back to my slides.
so the question is, why should you have an eco-friendly office? Um, and there's many, many reasons, of course. Um, eco-friendly offices make employees happier. There is um, also uh, increased customer loyalty, uh, of course, to be able to save the planet uh, and uh, to save huge on the energy bill and uh, in some countries get tax credits. I think there is a common misconception that if uh, if companies start switching to eco-friendly practices, it's going to cost them more. Uh, but in fact, uh, even uh, if initial changes um, uh, might cost a big lump sum, uh, over time, it does save money for many companies. Um, and uh, it, it is uh, actually financially much more benef beneficial. Uh, and of course, saving the planet should be the top reason to adopt e eco-friendly practices in the workspace. Um, and we know that it's, it's not just enough to uh, make businesses uh, make those decisions. Um, we have a lot of data that uh, the sustainability could benefit employees and, and also the companies. And um, this is, you know, from um from consumers loyalty to happy employees uh, actually working in a green space or in environmentally friendly space where you're making most use of the light which also saves you energy and uh, you have a very um uh, soft environment actually makes uh, your uh, employees much more productive uh, and using energy energy efficient lighting and and so on uh, creating uh, this environment and uh, this can be done with something very simple as putting more windows in your office and increasing just natural light and having better airflow. Um, and studies have shown that green offices encourage, encourage more productivity and a lot more happiness in employees. Um, and office workers with windows tend to get 173% more exposure to white light during the workday, resulting in an average of 46 extra minutes of sleep at night. And we know that um, good sleep schedule makes you much more productive. And there's lots of research being done around like why these, um, this is uh, really important. Um, for for the employees and employers uh, alike. Um, and I want to talk about briefly on uh, how to make uh, your office more eco-friendly. Um, and uh, most of you actually mentioned uh, a lot of the uh, factors that we're going to talk about. This is, of course, uh, shift to renewable energy sources, uh, solar panels, etc. Uh, reduce number of printers in the office or go completely digital if you can. There's many business management uh, platforms now that people can use um, and you can even install printers that are more uh, resource efficient right at the moment and there's um, companies that offer uh, to generate data for you on how much paper you're using how you can reduce that and where to install your printer in the office to create barriers so you, people are lazy if they have more barriers to for printing they're going to print less so this is something to also think about like behavior tendencies in your office and where you can place them and make them slightly inaccessible slightly inconvenient um, to discourage overuse of paper for example um, and then we're going to talk, in, talk about green, green procurement and I'm glad that someone also mentioned this in their um, in the interactive session uh, bringing a desk plant is also uh, good for air quality but also reduces uh, stress um, follow the green practices for office washrooms um, make sure that uh, you use towels as opposed to kitchen towels and, and make sure that uh, you have optimized um, 
uh, bathrooms installed where there's less uh, waters being used for the toilets and make sure that there's no um, leak or uh, dripping faucets um, because you can actually now there's some website where you can calculate just how much water you waste through this drip or leakage and uh, it can come to quite a lot um again make uh, the most out of the natural light uh, install motion activated light switches this is also something that someone mentioned in our interactive session um it support eco-friendly commute options uh and use green office supplies and opt for sustainable materials recycling was also mentioned and replacing plastic or especially um single you use plastic and uh, I'm going to focus on two things now about this I mean these are little practices that I'm sure all of you know very well about I'm going to talk a little bit more about green procurement um, and also talk about waste uh, minimizing waste in your office and uh, how we can potentially use waste audit to be able to do that um, so green procurement is a process to procure go goods, services and works with a reduced environmental impact throughout their life cycle when compared to goods, uh, services and works with the same primary function that would otherwise be procured. It is a tool to achieve environmental policy goals related to climate change, resource use and sustainable consumption and production. Our aim here is to establish uh, internal policies within the companies to be able to filter products that are not environmentally friendly, um, that are that use too many bad chemicals, or and do kind of price and quality comparison on the market. Do a little bit of market research and have specific criteria on when selecting uh, different categories of products. And if these are slowly established in, uh, in companies, the, uh, the environmental impact, it would be the negative environmental impact here would be reduced at a very significant level because individual action is good of course and is necessary but a collective action through companies um, establishing these uh, these policies internally really means really equates to a, a huge outcome and much more sustainable what once these policies are established uh, within the company, then it will continue and people and employees will have to uh, obey them. So uh, what does this green procurement promote? Uh, and of course, this is climate protection and CO2 reduction, circular economy, resource saving and use of renew renewable materials, energy efficiency, waste prevention and uh, non-toxic uh, material use. Um, and so on. Um, we actually have designed a green procurement guideline document, uh, which will soon be finalized, uh, finalized. And if you're interested, we will be able to share that with you, which lists a lot more um, factors as to what it helps to minimize and why green procurement um, is important uh, for your company. And uh, general principles that uh, these procurement regulations rely on are very similar to a normal uh, procurement principles. And they are, of course, value for money measures not only the cost of goods and services, but also takes into account factors such as quality, efficiency, effectiveness, and fitness for the purpose. Uh, protection of the environment in this case can be one of these factors and can therefore act as an equal consideration amongst other during the procurement process. So we're not just looking for cheapest and most effective thing, but also something uh, environmental protection uh, is basically equal to these criteria. Uh, we also, of course, obey the non-discrimination approach, equal access of service providers to the procurement process. So it's an open process like everything else. 
uh, equal treatment. Um, so you have comparable situations, not to not be treated differently. Um, and you're following the criteria, you just have a criteria environment protection as one of the priorities. Um, transparency, uh, of course, uh, continues and tender opportunities must be advertised widely enough to ensure competition. Uh, and proportion proportionality, uh, uh, which measures adopted in uh, measures adopted in a procurement process, should be appropriate to the objectives pursued, and should not go beyond what is necessary to achieve them. So these regulations in um, green, green procurement are the same, um, and uh, then you have kind of categories of um, different product products. So if you're looking at like um printing ink or if you're looking at cleaning uh, materials we are really looking at non-toxic materials we're checking there's a list of toxic materials that you should avoid that is also damaging for the environment and you can follow them uh, to understand um what you're purchasing um and uh, basically, I won't go into it too much detail because I will be able to share uh, these documents with you soon. Um, but every section basically has um, a criteria that encourages circular economy. Is it recyclable? So you should prioritize recyclable materials over non-recyclable materials. Um, uh, is it is the chemical composition? What does that mean? Uh, is there, uh, are the lights, for example, um, also LED lights, energy efficient lights? These are becoming part of the uh, policy of the company procurement. Um, and one thing that helps a lot with uh, these decision makings are eco labels. Uh, and eco labels, uh, although they do not really exist in Georgia, in some European countries are already um, quite well established, um, and there are certifications put on products to designate that they are environmentally friendly. And I have uh, some examples of them on on the screen. Um, there's there's very many, uh, unfortunately, still very confusing. Uh, but the EU provides its own eco label for products that are independently verified to have low environmental impact and um, some of these examples are right here and uh, including uh, their websites um, and you can use them for for different categories of products for example if you do have any questions on this so far Um, I'll take that as a no, and I'll move on to uh, waste audit. Um, so one of the uh, things that we have started doing recently is to um, get our, our companies and offices to reduce waste. Um, and at a first glance, it sounds like an, a simple a uh, simple task to do, but actually uh, it does take a lot of resources and a lot of time and a lot of planning. Uh, and what we have designed for this in order to uh, optimize the uh, process and make it easier for companies to do so, we have uh, uh, designed or developed a waste audit uh, system that helps companies uh, understand and collect data about their waste streams and tar use targeted interventions or targeted measures uh, that minimize uh, waste that is most commonly commonly produced. And of course, this uh, waste audit follows the waste hierarchy, which in the first place means to prevent uh, generation of waste to um, uh, reduce consumption uh, generation of waste in the first place and then uh, if there's anything that can be reused uh, do so um, and uh, only after that can we look at recycling um, and recovering disposal uh, disposal is basically uh, sending in the waste to the landfills uh, which uh, in countries like Georgia is not very um, uh, is not very good because we do not have many um, 
sanitary and protected uh, landfills. In fact, there are a lot of um, non-sanitary um, uncovered uh, landfills and hundreds and hundreds of uh, illegal dump sites, which uh, means that waste leaks into our environment much more easily than in places where, where there is a good infrastructure for waste management. Um, so what do we mean by uh, waste audit steps? Um, and there's a couple of uh, couple of things you can do for it. Uh, one of them is selecting a time, fr time fr frame. So select a window of time over which you will monitor your organization's waste, um, collecting the materials and sorting through them and measuring them. And there is, of course, uh, lots of companies would probably say that this is a lot of work. I'm not going to go through my bins and, and sort and measure um, or whatever trash we're producing. Uh, but okay, if uh, if this is not possible, there's a simpler way to do this is uh, uh, basically collecting and sampling, kind of doing more observational and writing down, um, just recording uh, what is being disposed of within the office. You can do a photo-based uh, sampling, for example, um, and then, uh, then you start basically uh, volume and weight estimates. So if you are uh, interested in how much about volume of certain amount of waste is generated, uh, you can gather this information by examining the waste um, receptacles before they're emptied and record how full they are or how much they weigh uh, and record this data throughout the sample period um, and keep in mind that this won't provide information on the composition of your waste, but it will uh, give you information how much waste is generated in general. But you can also note down uh, just from observation and photo-based uh, analysis of what types of waste you are seeing the most. Um, and you can also, what you can do is look at your procurement list and look at what, you pro what you're purchasing most of and see if uh, what, which ones of these uh, items are most likely to turn into waste very quickly. For example, bin bags or um, plastic cups or single-use cups for the coffee machines. And that will also give you an idea of how much waste you're, uh, you are generating. Um, and of course, uh, then calculation is a huge part, uh, a very important part of this process. Um, and you can uh, you can calculate how much money you can save by purchasing less um, and replacing uh, the most wasteful items, for example. But if, for example, I have and uh, why it is important to look at this data, to collect data in the first place. If, for example, I have a coffee machine on the on the bottom floor of my company, but then there is um, filter coffees uh, with in the kitchens everywhere on other floors, um, and reusable caps are only placed on the bottom floor. Um, I might be. I might first think, oh, let's just take get rid of the reusable cups, but actually they're not being used at all. Uh, actually, it's unreachable, this coffee machine in my uh, scenario, and not many people go there. So it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really change much for me if I uh, put my efforts in uh, intervening there or not. So it's important to see uh, what is actual situation on the ground and understand that what what is situation in your environment and where the where the waste is uh, generated uh, and this kind of helps you see the the picture on the ground the real picture and then decide where you're going to um, intervene uh, where it's actually going to be meaningful results uh how are we doing in the time okay great so um we also designed a guide to host uh low waste events uh, and before i go on to making specific tips um perhaps you can tell me what you think or whether you 
have any experience in trying to have zero waste conduct or put on zero zero waste events and what you have done to do so. You can uh, put your microphone on or um, use the chat. Does anyone want to share their opinions? Okay, I take it that um, no one has uh, tried to conduct um, low waste events. Actually, there was one person who was very active on our chat earlier. Uh, and I think I will uh, perhaps pick on people uh, to see. Uh, how about Eliso? Have you? What do you think um, would con what would you do uh, if you were putting on uh, a low waste or zero waste event if you are if you're with us? Or um, oh, she doesn't have um, a microphone icon. Um, uh, so maybe uh, Gune, you can answer. Uh, hello, everybody. Can you oh, hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for such an interesting uh, webinar and such an interesting topic. Uh, I'm kind of a newbie in this uh, sphere, so the only thing that I can say that I'm contributing to this kind of green uh, topic is that I'm always collecting these plastic bottles that I'm consuming and then taking to the special recycled bins that uh, uh, are uh, in uh, several areas in Tbilisi uh, mm -hmm. and also always trying to um, ask at the shops. I'm not, uh, I mean, uh, asking the shop assistant not to give me this plastic uh, bags and because I'm always carrying my um, multiple use, let's say, uh, bags. Uh, and also never using uh, the strokes, of course. That's the minimum I'm doing <laughs> so far, but I would like to contribute more, of course. Yeah, perfect. I mean, uh, it's funny because even though uh, <laughs> officially plastic bags are banned in Georgia, like Eliso said, they are, um, they are widely used and this legislation hasn't really been put into place properly. Uh, and everyone is uh, still using uh, plastic bags like supermarkets, shops, and, and customers are also demanding it continuously. And when you say you don't want plastic bags, they look at you like you are an alien or something. Um, thank you. Does anyone else want to contribute and uh, tell me how you would put on an event if you wanted to make it uh, zero waste or at least uh, low waste? Okay, then I will uh, move on to tips um, and specific components of um, how one might do that. Uh, Okay, uh, of course, uh, firstly, it's important to uh, reduce uh, paper waste, uh, and this constitutes email attendees, uh, the schedule and agenda ahead of time, uh, and um, make sure that our invitations are recyclable. Uh, that means avoiding like bright colored or dark colored fluorescent or metallic papers, which cannot be recycled and um, uh, and also just going digital wherever you can. Um, if you want to distribute name tags, print them on recycled materials. Um, and we sometimes suggest where one might get recycled paper for, for the events. Um, uh, you can make sure that you're providing Wi-Fi to guests and send out electronic in invitations and advise them, kind of brand the event, uh, non-paper -pa waste event, 
um, and uh, make sure that they uh, ask them to use electronic version of uh, invitations or whatever. Uh, and of course, it's much easier to reduce plastic waste, asking your venues to provide uh, beverages in glass and reusable items. Uh, I ask them not to provide you single use cups. Uh, instead of having these packaged packaged uh, condiments, you can use like uh, you can use the jars for them. Have uh, straws taken out of the uh, list, um, and of course, single use plastic plates and utens utensils can be easily replaced with reusable ones. You just have to make sure to agree this ahead of time with your catering company or or the venue that you're contracting. Um, uh, in advance uh, and then uh, reducing food waste is very important what I usually do is I I count the number of attendees and uh, on average we probably have 60 percent attendance rate from the invitations that we give out uh, and I count that it's 60 percent of that amount and I still uh, order food for 50% of the people invited because most of the time the food is left over and some people do not stay um, all the way through the event and some people will not eat as much um, etc so it's uh, for me from environmental perspective and especially food it's uh, important to have a little bit less than too much um, and we request from caterers that they only prepare enough food for the number that we are saying. Um, and then uh, we try to encourage plant-based menu uh, as a reduction in meat consumption, uh, leading to dietary GHD emissions, reducing uh, GHD emissions. Um, and we plan the menu to include seasonal organic food and lo locally produced food. And this is something, especially if you're doing um, this uh, in developing countries where um, it also means empowering uh, local producers. Um, and uh, always keep track of uh, the amount of food left over uh, after each event. Uh, and then you can then somehow understand how to order better next, next time and how to improve that percentage. Um, and of course, uh, you can uh, organize events so that uh, you ensure there's a recycling system set up uh, for different ty types of uh, recycling. You might not need glass because many events might not have uh, glass waste um, and it's important to have signage for that so make sure you're branding uh, your events advertise ahead of time that this is going to be low waste or zero waste event and anything that is produced as waste please recycle make an announcement ahead of time when opening the event uh, and really use that um, as a um, as a, uh, a PR for your event, uh, 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 as a trademark PR for your event to make sure that um, people understand what you're trying to achieve. Uh, and there are other, um, other materials that are easily avoidable. And this is, for example, decorations that are designed for one-time use only. Uh, uh, if you really need to use banners uh, for the event or that are digital and use screens instead of actually print materials um, and uh, thematize uh, the whole thing around sustainability. Um, so I'm going to move on to the second part of our uh, presentation. Um, and this is more to do with behavior levers and understanding um, our behaviors a little bit better. Uh, since we're a little bit pressed for time, um, I'm going to use this. Um, uh, we have a poll to a question to pose to the audience. Uh, and the question is, what do you think influences your behavior the most? 
Is it material incentives? So you paying less or you're getting some money or uh, some resource out of it. Uh, is it emotional appeal? Uh, for example, you care so much about animal welfare that uh, this is enough to influence your, um, your behavior? Uh, or is it trend and keeping up to the trend? Like does social influence uh, have uh, can drive your behavior change um, or is it rules of regulations uh, when a law is implemented and you fear for example fines or something that you just easily obey and adjust to it uh, uh, or is it being prompted uh, is it being uh, prompted by easier choices and by that I mean um, for example, if you have reminders, uh, then you're able to make uh, changes much more easily. I just want you to say, which one of these do you think is the most effective tool in order to change one's behavior? Emotional appeal. Well, in my opinion, the emotional appeal and the social uh, rules and regulations are important. And I think that I assume it uh, works like effectively um, rather than, for instance, promotion. Yeah, of course, promotion and raising awareness campaign and all this stuff is working. But when you touch the emotional <laughs> sense of people, of human, mm -hmm. and they, it makes them to it makes them to, 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 to think twice and uh, to change their behavior, uh, but it also should be put into priority uh, topic and agenda of politicians, of state, mm -hmm. and of course, fines, charts uh, should also follow this um, instruction, let's say. So it is really important to have this kind of rules and uh, regulations. So uh -huh. who should uh, be aware of what they are waiting, what they will face in case, for instance, they are like, uh, for instance, they are like uh, cons consume more like plastics or throwing plastics in the streets and all this stuff. So just like coming up my mind, this kind of um, cases. Uh huh. Exactly. Uh, very interesting what you just mentioned because you mentioned rules and regulations are really important. To, to do, but emotional appeal is also very important. Uh, and this is just a testament that you really need a, a comprehensive, like holistic approach to think how you're going to change anything. And you can only really change things if you approach it from all angles. Um, and there's so many examples. Uh, for example, in Georgia, uh, people were not wearing seat belts for, for many, many years because it was assumed that if you wear a seatbelt, you're insulting the driver because they're uh, they're putting you apparently in danger, uh, and you don't trust the driver. And um, there are lots of campaigns, maybe not a lot, but some campaigns and uh, some information uh, dissemination around this topic to encourage people to start wearing seatbelts. And it wasn't until regulations strict regulations that came into force with very strict fines that people started to uh started to change <clears throat> this behavior and but it's not enough it's not enough just to say rules and regulations um you, they have to understand why um, the information is important um and also the emotional appeal is very important they need to be able to emotionally connect to this issue uh, in order to prompt their decision making um, and I will talk about that a little bit more in depth shortly I just want to talk about like why this is important consumer behavior matters consumer experience matters it's okay for us to say oh this is not good for the environment therefore we're going to change it but we if we don't take into account uh what consumer behaviors there could be a backlash 
uh, it could uh, really be counterproductive uh, and it could do more harm uh, than good. Uh, and why is consumer behavior really important and experience really important to understand is that it makes us challenge our assumptions. Something that I talked about at the beginning of our um, of the presentation, we might, in our own bubble, we might assume that these things are very easy. It's very easy for me to not use plastic bags anymore because I have all these other options. It's very easy to not use plastic bottles um, anymore, but it's not uh, equally easy for someone uh, living in a remote village who doesn't have much options of anything else. Um, and this is, really something that people miss i think that we all apply the same uh, same conditions for everyone and we assume that because we think in our condition in our experience like that so might the others um and one of the very good examples was that for me for example i don't understand why in any office it would be um a problem to use reusable cups and glasses or have like anything but it was uh really um we found out from our research that in larger offices and in one particular office especially uh, especially after covid people were strong very strongly against shared dishes and cups uh due to hygienic uh, reasons and this really acted as a huge barrier as to why they were not willing to switch to something else um, and we had to take that into account uh, and really understand what we would what could be done in order to overcome this barrier uh, and these behavior levels that I just mentioned, they have been designed by uh, um, a research institute into behavior science. Um, and they have categorized uh, these uh, emotional, uh, these uh, psychological components that all contribute to our behavior. And like I mentioned, these are emotional appeals, social influence, choice architecture, and I will talk about what that means in a minute, uh, information, material incentives, uh, and rules and regulations. The most common tactics uh, for behavior change are these three. This is what most people think are important, that if you give them material incentives, which is basically means pay them, uh, rules and regulations, so stop them doing from something uh, and inform them, just tell them. And they think, most people think that these three are enough to uh, influence some sort of uh, change. They're necessary, but often they do not work and, and ex clear examples and evidence have shown that they do not necessarily work. Uh, financial incentives can backfire, uh, payments can uh, crowd out other motivators, uh, incentives can drain limited resources, um, and fines can be seen as just the cost for behavior. Um, and as for rules and regulations, they often need uh, enforcement. And if there is no enforcement, like in this plastic bag situation in Georgia, then the behavior doesn't change. Uh, and rules do not work if norms are misaligned. So uh, cultural context, for example, for this is very important. Uh, and correcting an information deficit rarely really leads to lasting behavior change. It's one thing for me to know that something is wrong and another thing for me to act on it. Uh, and it's one thing for me to care about something and completely different thing for me to change it at my inconvenience or at some cost of or another. Um, so, it's very important. It's also important to consider other aspects of psychology, and this is um, emotions, uh, which actually drive us to act. Um, and 
creating social um, social uh, architecture, social influence, I mean, which means we are talking, we're looking at trends, modern trends of contemporary world, we're looking at role models, we're, li we're listening to opinion makers, we're taking examples that already exist and that have already uh, shown to work. And this kind of influences the flow of our behavior uh, and really drives us to do similar things. We do copy and mirror each other quite a lot. Um, and that's something not to be dismissed. Um, and so when you're working on some changes, it's really good to have uh, pioneers already in this field and as to, that can act as trend setting, normalize someone who is normalizing or, or groups of people, communities that are normalizing a certain behavior. Um, and uh, and the third one, and I think this is one of the most important ones, is choice architecture. And uh, choice architecture is what are the con circumstances in which I'm making the choice and how easy it is for me to make that choice. And we will talk about that a little bit more. Um, so emotion appeals means using emotional messages in addition to or instead of appeals uh, that appeals to reason. Um, and this is something that uh, we can talk about what different kinds of emotions, right? We're talking about pride. We can talk about hope, fear, anger, interest, or prospect of shame. And shame is really widely used in environmental aspect. And I think in anything, uh, we're really more inclined to use shame as a driving factor than anything else. But do you think, do you think that works? Do you think shame is a good driver of people's behavior? You can answer in the chat or put your microphone on. I would be really interested to see whether you, yes? Well, I think that uh, shame, it is working, uh, but uh, if to take a cons if to, uh, take in consideration the situations that uh, countries in South Caucasus is, um, is a bit different than, for instance, the countries in, uh, in in Europe. So shame, I'm not sure that it it is a good tool. It's an efficient way to kind of to um the, to explain people about the importance of recycle stuff or about the green circle um, um, uh, circle economy and all the stuff because. People just like uh, basically they are not aware of why it is shame, for instance, to use more plastics, to throw this away, to uh, to consume more, I don't know, for instance, food waste and all this stuff. They are not aware. So before like uh, taking the shaming <laughs> action, so mm -hmm. it's better to like, appeal, of course, emotional side to mm -hmm. make a more like a holistic as you um mentioned like regulations law and uh, marketing also some campaign and all the stuff so after it yes i'm pretty sure that if this uh, story like uh, behind uh will touch the people's heart and brain yeah after it the action of shaming and all the stuff will uh will have a, a strong um, i think the, uh, the result mm -hmm. but but yeah it's just it's like important to understand the uh, to what level uh, the society is aware of uh, of harm and mm -hmm. uh, negative uh, uh, outcome of plastics and uh, and and yes and all the stuff yeah yes uh, interesting so you are saying that first that obviously has to be some information and understanding around why. Um, we're asking for whatever we're asking for um and then uh and then you know shame is not actually a very effective um effective tool um perhaps but i'm also talking about like you know if you know should we scare people should we shame them should we we anger them or should we kind of approach it from a more positive um positive angle uh 
um, you know, shame does stop people from doing a certain behavior. Like if they're littering, if they're putting stuff on the streets and someone comes and shames them, some kind of calls them out on this behavior, which is now um, established that it's a, it, it's a wrong behavior. It's, um, it's a shameful behavior and someone catches them out. Are they likely to continue doing that? Perhaps it will have a kind of impact that they will stop. Um, Yes, exactly. So uh, Elisa said that it might generate more anger. Um, uh, raising it, awareness could be more productive. Uh, uh, emotional appeal probably works effectively more in developed countries. Interesting. Um, yes, so could be, uh, could be uh, differences in cultures, of course. Um, but I think somehow a uh, shame factor is um, maybe sometimes a little bit discouraging as in uh, you are creating negative associations around this behavior or, or desired behavior and giving people perhaps a bad experience, a, a, a negative experience as opposed to positive experience that is associated with this uh, desired behavior. And there was an interesting study that was done um, back in 2009, uh, which suggests that uh, pride, uh, pride is um, much bigger uh, motivating factor for behavior than shame. Uh, and these results suggested that when consumers anticipate pride, uh, self-control is much more enhanced uh, uh, when the um, environment fosters a focus on the self. So in this study, respondents were invited in a in laboratory, which was controlled environment, randomly assigned to one of the uh, rooms equipped with video cameras, and they had a cake in front of them in a clear uh, packaging where they could, and they had a fork and a plate. Um, and respondents were asked to open the container and examine the cake. And they were instructed to eat as much or as little uh, of the cake that they desired, but also to anticipate how much shame, either shame they would feel as a result of eating it, uh, or uh, how much pride they would feel as a result of not eating. So one group was told that, you know, uh, if you eat this, uh, it was so shameful, blah, blah, blah. And the other, team was told that um, uh, you know made them feel proud if they didn't eat it um, and the result uh, looked like this so um, groups that were associated with pride exerted a lot more self-control than the ones that were associated with shame so that's something that's um, very important to take into consideration when we are designing some interventions and then the next one uh, I want to talk about is choice architecture um, and social, social influence. Yes, uh, we talked about social influence, which, which um, deals with behavior, beliefs and expectations. Uh, and this is kind of leveraging behavior, beliefs and interest of others using role models. Uh, and like publicly broadcasting who has and has not engaged in the desired behavior, provide a way for people to show they are doing the desired behavior. It's like demonstrating very clearly what a, a good behavior perceived norm is, changing that perceived norm in the public eye and highlighting possibility of social sanctions for doing undesired behavior and this kind of like network influence. Uh, that we often uh, uh, can use to influence others. Uh, and it can also eliminate excuses for not engaging in a certain type of behavior and for example, encourage public commitments or pledges. This is a social structural uh, approach, uh, provide visible indicators that signal support for the desired behavior, for example, giving them badges or pins or hats, something that unites them, something that unifies and normalizes this behavior that you're part of this social norm now. 
Um, and you will see that this works really well because some uh, charity campaigns and uh, will have symbol or some disaster solidarity will have symbols. And this is kind of like a social structure influence that like people belong to some uh, some of the bigger things um, and they're part of this um, social structure. Uh, so yeah, this very much pays on uh, plays on your emotion to of belonging to something. Uh, and then choice architecture is a, a tricky one, but very, very interesting. And this is thinking about the context in which information and choices are presented. And uh, so here we we are talking about designing the decision making context through the way that we can prompt structure or frame choices. Uh, and this can be done through like direct attention, make desired behavior the default option. So you kind of like you divert people to only like attend their attention to only this choice um, and simplify message messages of decisions kind of like uh, really make this decision making process very simple and clear to them. This can really influence what one does streamline complex decisions to focus on key information or actions that provide shortcuts for behavior with many steps or, or, or other options. And this is something that I always use in my communications officer position that like when I'm communicating with people or media or public, I really want to be as simple and as one dimensional in sometimes at first, to be able to engage that attention and grab that attention and be very clear. And then you can go into nuance. But when you're prompting decision-making, it's much uh, more effective uh, to be simple and clear. And, and a very uh, interesting example of this is the research that was done uh, about consumer behavior in a supermarket where they have, where they were, offering uh, kind of tasters of these jams uh, in a supermarket. And, and there are two controlled behaviors. So uh, one uh, offered uh, six jams basically to taste. Um, and in this one, 40% of people, consumers, stop to taste the jam and from that 40 percent 30 percent went on to purchase it uh, so it worked it was a uh, easy choice for them then again uh, in the same setting uh, the supermarket offered 24 more choices of jams to taste and more people stopped 60 percent stopped to taste it um, and it led to zero purchases so this is kind of too much choice mm, confuses people leads to more inaction and this is something that's very important to understand in different settings that if we have too many choice for overloading people with choices uh, and giving them all these options perhaps it's not uh, necessarily effective because you're confusing you you're overwhelming them uh, and this is something that you can take into consideration when um, when you're designing some interventions uh, and this behavior centered design that uh, I worked with uh, earlier this year um, and worked with the center center for behavior and the environment uh, this uh, social scientist um, uh, organize a research organization. We work together uh, with Prevent Waste Alliance to design specific interventions based on studying behavior patterns. And this is kind of what the process looks like when, uh, when you're designing um, something uh, related to behavior, uh, behavior change. Uh, and this roadmap kind of gives you uh, a bigger picture of the steps that you need to take in order to be able to apply this approach. Uh, and, you know, uh, first step is framing this. So 
understanding the context uh, and what the problems, issues are, where they're coming from, the source of the problem. And then you move on to actually investigate your target audience and uh, the behavior that is existing. And this is to empathize with them. Why are they doing what they're doing? Why are they not doing what, what they're doing? Uh, what are the motivations? What are the barriers? What are the contexts for it? And you do that through research, different research methodologies. It can be in-depth interviews, uh, observations, surveys, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and then you contextualize, analyze uh, these, um, these data and you uh, kind of understand what stems from what from data analysis and from that you draw the solutions, what could be targeted solutions for each behavior pattern. Um, and from that, then you can come up with as many, uh, as many, um, as many solutions as possible. Uh, so I'm being told that we don't have much time uh, left. We have five minutes. But during that five minutes, um, I want to present to you uh, a scenario that I have drafted, and it's an, a real life scenario that um, maybe we can work on together. I will quickly read it and I'll, I'll give you one or two minutes to give me your potential answers. Uh, this is supposed to be a group work, but since there's not that many of us, um, we can just uh, do it together. So here's a scenario. An insurance company with offices in a large city, which has three floors and about 100 employees. Uh, the company wants to uh, move more towards eco-friendly practices, and uh, but has limited resources. Uh, and we've done the research, the empathize uh, section, and we found out the following, that some of the most used plastic items are bottles, cups, and bags, uh, and employees themselves named the following uh, as barriers to switching to alternatives. So they had lack of options for reusable items available to them. Um, half the company does not see the necessity of why they should even switch to uh, an alternative. And over 60% of the employees do not want to share, do not want shared cups placed in the kitchen because of uh, hygienic reasons. Um, and many employees use uh, single use items during birthday parties, let's say birthday uh, days um, because uh, there's too many dishes to wash afterwards. Um, and it was also discovered that company throws out plastic bags from individual bins every other day. So 100 plastic bags per every other day. Uh, and employees at the office do not recycle as they don't have a recycling point near them um, and they don't possess any information about them. So just Considering this situation, um, which one of these uh, factors would you use and what would you do, what interventions would you implement to try and reduce uh, plastic waste or waste, generally waste in, in this company? So you have, uh, if you wanted to use emotional appeal, what would you do? A, a, a simple example uh, or social influence. Uh, you could have choice architecture. I mean, um, obviously there are some limitations in real life, but in this scenario, hypothetically, you're happy to suggest anything you think would work, considering, taking into consideration what uh, the data that we have in front of us. You can either um, use the chat or um, put your microphone on. Do you have any questions, first of all?
I think that the insurance company may encourage their employees to bring their own bottles, cups, um, for daily use now. Uh, yes. Um, and do you think they'll be happy to um, go through that effort? Yeah, but uh, I think that, well, in general, uh, people uh, in Azerbaijan, I'm talking about Azerbaijan, Mm -hmm. In big companies, no matter the scale of company, big or small, everyone carry out their own uh get, get their own uh cups, uh and bottles. So if there's a dispenser like where they they can get the water and the coffee, yes, on that uh that machine, yes, people just they have to <laughs> use these plastic bags. But recently, I realized that the less plastic bags are putting that machine more like a paper bags for recycling uh, issue. Yes. Yeah, so it's, uh, imagine you have a company and no one is bringing uh, their own caps or bottles. They're buying bottled water, but you want them to bring um, reusable ones. You want them to encourage to stop buying plastic. So what would you do? Like in this scenario, what people are saying, uh, what would you do to encourage their behavior change? But the thing is like, and the company cannot just prohibit or I don't know, to exactly. say stop <laughs> technically. Yeah. It, it is impossible because it's a choice. At least this is a basic of human rights. Yeah. Uh, so maybe like emotional appeal in this uh, case will be more effective. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, took not the door of people's mind. <laughs> mm -hmm. not, don't enter to this building uh, with your plastic bags or uh, bottles or cups. Uh, so you would uh, have some emotional thing to it and also like choice architecture that is... Yeah, choice architecture, emotional. But actually, uh, it will be good like if company like going more like strictly like rules and regulations, but I still like it's scaring me when a company said like, no, uh, like this is not a state that actually this is a company insurance company. Um, um, so yeah, more uh, in the, um, uh, yes, we have information here. Yeah, more like informative way, emotional appealing and the um, choice architecture is also, um it is also may help in this case mm -hmm. so with a uh, choice architecture for example if you had uh, you putting a sign where would you put it and how would you do it so people are like uh really mm, use you know take take that into account that so it's effective hmm well so you mean the location? Uh, location or time of day or anything. What would you... Maybe what, uh, like entrance. <laughs> entrance, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So in order everyone to, to, to grab attention. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, so this is also... Uh, this is a real-life example. We had to work with this. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we did rules and regulations. So we uh, we managed to change some procurement rules uh, within the organization uh, to for like events or within the company, what they could procure and what not as on behalf of the company. So you can't really tell uh, people you cannot use it and ban it. Of course, it's too much. You're infringing their personal rights. Uh, um, but the company can have this kind of um, approach that when purchasing for the company, you can change some things. And what um, what they thought what would work better is material incentive and the, to buy all the employees uh, their individual bottle. And in that, uh, why was uh, consumer experience very important? Again, somehow there was some mistrust with the quality of water in the office so some people thought it tasted weird some people were totally fine with it so um, actually dispensers were uh, a good idea uh, to install uh, dispensers because it's more reliable water to them but have it in their individual bottles that the company distributed 
for their employees um, and basically said no more excuses you can have uh, your own uh, item here and you can drink your own water um, and, and not have to share anything uh, with and we also used uh, kind of some emotional messages uh, everywhere where we put up signs of like saving this much uh, plastic uh, is amounts to like uh, five stadiums of, of plastic and, and things like that um, and where there were like coffee machines for example we also put the signs that please use your own cup um, and with emotional appeal we taught uh, they had some uh, emotional messages of the wildlife destruction caused by pollution but we really tried to use all of them so with information we trained them we provided three-day training just on plastic waste and harmful effects of um, plastic waste uh, and with reminders we were thinking of uh, basically uh, placing signs like um, at the exit on the other side when they're going for example shopping to the, they have some like shared reusable bags in the office that they have to bring back and just reminding that if, if you're going shopping if you're going to pick up some groceries on the way home please pick up this bag like don't forget the bag um, and we talked about like uh, SMS reminders to at a certain uh, point during the day to remind them to either take a bag or, or, or to remind them to recycle. And with recycling, um, what the company did is they removed the individual bins from the desks. Um, so it they created a kind of a hurdle to get to the bin to put something in the bin. And we found that like, uh, actually this worked to reduce a little bit of uh, the amount of waste they're producing because it's then they have to put it on their desk or walk over to the bin. Uh, and next to the bin, we placed recycling bins for plastic. So anyone who was walking there, they, you, they would see it. It was very visible. If they had any plastic in their hand, it's right there. They can just put it in there and be like, uh, not forget to do so. Uh, and and yes, things like that. So um, uh, I think the point here is that um, using combination of these approaches uh, to really monitor and observe whether the, any of them influence any change is important to achieve any sort of um, lasting results. Um, and I'm going to end uh, my presentation, my talk here. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and for your engagement.